I have not read all this year's books, and I can't actually spoil too much. Well, I could spoil a scene right in the middle, and Jack would hurt me. <laughs> Where they have the nightmare scene. I'm getting in big trouble, so I don't do that. We are looking at the third book about Daisy Johansson. Um, I really was thinking about getting a row of shot glasses and doing the thing I told her about when I took a drink of something every time Daisy flicks her tail, because there's a whole bunch of that in the start of the movie. <laughs> For some reason, her publicist thought that was the weirdest thing she'd ever heard of ours. Jacqueline thought it was okay, I think. <laughs> When booksellers are born twisted, that's just the way it is. Um, so as usual, Daisy's got some issues with romance, which you guys will know if you're the first two books. I'm talking about picking a couple of troublesome boyfriends, eventually. So I thought uh, Kate Daniels had problems until I read the Daisy Johansson. And now we've got people buying up real estate, and night hags, and all kinds of this stuff going on. I'm not going to spoil. Please welcome back on there. Thank you, Dwayne, for having me back one more time. Um, this is sort of people saying, oh, how's the book tour going? This isn't really a book tour. This is sort of a book holiday. <laughs> um, I am having tomorrow a milestone birthday. And I was trying to figure out, what am I going to do? I got a book coming out at the same time. And part of me wanted to say, just screw it, I'm going to the Barbados or something. <laughs> and then part of me is like, no, you should work it into promotion. <laughs> and when my good friend Sean Speakman of the sign page said, hey, you up for doing it one more time? I thought, OK. Um, there's no real publicity budget this time around, but I can get myself to Seattle. And. Uh, make signed books available to anybody who wants them worldwide doing that. And then also, maybe Dwayne would be willing to have me back at the University Bookstore, <laughs> which he was. And all of you, thank you for coming out to see me. Um, I'm also going to tell you that this is kind of a bittersweet time for me. Um, quite unexpected, well, not unexpectedly, I shouldn't say, but last week, um, I got a phone call from the sister of a good friend of mine who had been in the hospital battling cancer for a long time. And she basically said, if you want to see Laura, don't hesitate. And so my girlfriend, Julie, who is visiting Seattle for the very first time, and I threw together a whirlwind trip out to New York to visit our friend. Um, which we are so very, very glad we did because about 36 hours after we left, she passed away. And um, I had initially been thinking, I, I, I don't have a new project. Every time I've been on the road reading, uh, I've tried to do something from what's coming next. And first of all, I don't have a project I'm ready to unveil. So I thought, well, maybe I'm going to go back to the beginning and do Kushil's start to the first chapter. I did a reading of that this summer with um, John Scalzi and I. Talk about an odd couple <laughs> read together at the North American Science Fiction Convention in Detroit. And it went really well. He did these incredibly humorous essays from when he was a journalist. And I read this incredibly dramatic opening <laughs> chapter. But they were really complimentary. Uh, however, as you may detect, on this whirlwind trip to New York that involved staying up until, or getting up at 3.30 in the morning to catch a flight and driving across the state and uh, traveling Spirit Airlines and going, God damn it, you're not getting an extra dime from me. <laughs> <laughs> I can pack everything I need in one purse and still look pretty decent for three days. I did that. I also caught a rather unpleasant cold uh, that, is just not putting me up to the to the task of reading some Baroque beautiful fiction. I, I hadn't read it for a long time, and it is challenging to read. Um, but at the same time, when I visited my friend, oh, and I'm really sorry to set you off, Jules. Um, when we visited our friend Laura in New York, <coughs> she was one of those people, she was, uh, 
strong-willed, stubborn as hell, funny, determined. And she's been in the hospital for months and she's like, you know, I have been trying to get my family to read your Kushiel books for years and they wouldn't. <laughs> By the way, her father's an English professor. And he's like, no, too dense for me. <laughs> but he had come into her room, um, her hospital room earlier in the summer and she was reading Dark Currents, the first of the Agent of Hell books. And she was laughing and laughing, going, oh my gosh, you know, I know that place. And he was like, what is that? Is that one of Jacqueline's books? And she said, yeah, you really ought to try it, Dad. <laughs> and she said, wouldn't you know, he actually finally picked one up and read it. And he's like, hey, this is really good. <laughs> and um, he was the one who, who broke the news to me um, after a day, essentially, after our visit. And, um, you know, he, he's kind of choked up and breaking down a little. I'm breaking down a little. And, and, and as we get through this, then he says, I really liked your book. <laughs> and I'm thinking, my God, how can you even tell me this at a time like that? But then I realized, you know, it was... It was something that he and his daughter were able to share and enjoy in those you know, last months of her life and something that she, he knew was really special to her because I'm a dear friend. And he kind of got his English professor on and, and, and he said, you know, I, I just, I really love the juxtaposition of this, this whimsy and, and the fantastic against the, the verisimilitude of small town life. <laughs> I'm like, that's exactly right. <laughs> I got my tissue. And um, so I, I think this is an excerpt from Poison Fruit. I don't think it's one that I've read before. But um, I wanted to read it, A, because it is an awful lot easier to read than, than the Kushiel books <clears throat> when you're straining that to, to cough. Um, and it's brief. Uh, but also in in honor of, of my friend and of this wonderful connection that, that they made and shared with me and I'm now sharing with you guys in all of its whimsy and verisimilitude. <laughs> uh, this is kind of starting a little bit mise-en-scene. If you're not familiar with the books, my protagonist Daisy is a uh, hellspawn, a single mom, occasional incubus dad. She does indeed have a tail that twitches in a way that one could make a drinking game out of. <laughs> I think that would be kind of funny. And she and her uh, sometime <coughs> werewolf cop partner slash lover are in this abandoned Presbyterian camp searching for a bogle. And, and I also want to say uh, that for me, this series has an added poignancy because uh, it is a snapshot. It's an open secret that it's based on my own hometown of Saugatuck, Michigan. And like any community, it's in a state of flux. Like any community, there is conflict between conservation and development, which is one of the major themes that plays out in Poison Fruit. And uh, there are things I've kind of documented in here that are now gone. And in fact, this very setting of the Presbyterian camp uh, was sold and is going to be developed and the mess hall we encounter has probably already been torn down. So I think it functions really well as a snack. What are you laughing at? I'm up here telling poignant stories. And here is my old friend. <laughs> and very <similitude. laughs> All right. Well, I'm fixing to juxtapose here. <laughs> Halfway up the incline, Cody held out one arm. Hold on, he said, nostrils working. I smell something. Bogle, I asked. He glanced at me, phosphorescent green flashing behind his eyes. I'm guessing yes. Smells like moldy old leather and bracken. Sounds like a bogle to me, I said, but what do I know? Cody grinned. Let's check it out. The wind picked up as we climbed higher, the sound of waves growing louder. All around us, trees creaked and groaned, branches scraping against one another. 
It was all a very Blair Witch project. I wrapped my arms around myself against the cold, trying not to think about the fact that that movie scared the crap out of me. Atop the incline, the woods gave way to another clearing, surrounded by outlying buildings. In the center was a jungle gym made of plastic timbers and wide tubes that looked surprisingly sinister in the darkness. Anything could be lurking in those seemingly innocuous tubes. With my right hand, I reassured myself that Dauda Dagger was secure in the sheath I wore belted around my waist. Standing in the clearing, Cody turned his head this way and that, testing the air. It's been here, he said, a lot, but I can't tell which scent trail is fresh. He gave me an apologetic look. I'm going to have to shift to track it, Daisy. Wolf's got to do what a wolf's got to do, I said. Just try to remember that if you plunge into the woods, I'm going to have a hard time following you. I'll try. He shrugged out of his tan Carhartt jacket and handed it to me. Here, put this on. You might as well stay warm. Be careful. The keys to the truck are in the right-hand pocket. Duly noted, I said, and thanks. Cody's jacket retained the warmth of his body and a trace of his scent. Pine and musk and polo. Engulfed in it. <coughs> and that's why I'm not doing the really challenging reading. <laughs> I watched him undress with unselfconscious efficiency, removing his off-duty shoulder holster and his Timberland boots, folding his clothing and setting it alongside the flashlight on the rough-hewn wooden bench the Presbyterians had thoughtfully provided in the vicinity of the jungle gym. For a moment, his naked human body was pale and luminous in my night vision, his skin stippled with goose flesh. Then he shifted. It happened in the blink of an eye, one form flowing into another. Cody's wolf form was long-limbed and rangy, with tawny gray fur and alert amber eyes filled with inhuman intelligence. I'm not saying it was animal intelligence, not exactly, but it definitely wasn't human. Cody the human and Cody the wolf overlapped, but they weren't the same beings. You know, you're the reason we can't be together, I said to the wolf. It cocked its head at me, ears pricked. No offense, I know it's not your fault. I'm just saying. The wolf merely continued to regard me. I sighed. Go on, go hunt the bogle. It turned and trotted into the darkness, muzzle low to the ground. Let me tell you, it is not easy to follow a hunting wolf, night vision or not. I did my best, stumbling after the Cody wolf on the frozen ground he seemed to glide over with effortless ease trying to ignore the ominous creaking trees as the wolf made a circuit of this particular area of the camp. I caught up with the wolf on the verge of a dense thicket of woods where he'd paused to stare into the darkness. I was sure he was about to go where I'd have a hell of a time following, but to my surprise he sniffed the ground, then turned and headed back toward the camp at that deceptively speedy trot. The wolf made a beeline for a building with a wooden sign in the front reading Mess Hall halting in front of the door. You're sure about that? I asked dubiously. Ellie said the bogle's haunt was in the woods. Raising one paw, the wolf scratched at the door. Okay, okay. I turned the doorknob and found it locked. Looks like a pretty old door, I said to the wolf. Let's try the credit card trick. I didn't have a credit card on me, but I had my police ID card. The Cody Wolf obligingly got out of the way, sitting on its haunches on the cold ground behind me, panting softly and watching with its tongue lolling while I slid my ID card between the door and the frame and wiggled it in an effort to jimmy the lock. I was so focused on the task at hand, I forgot to be apprehensive about what I might find on the other side. I think I've almost... With a jerk, the door swung inward abruptly. I let out a shriek as a tall, black figure with eyes like molten lava, pointy, misshapen features, and hands the size of bony catcher's mitts lunged at me, teeth bared. I flung up a shield at the same time I hurled myself backward, tripping over the wolf and falling hard on my back on the frozen earth, knocking the wind out of me. The Cody wolf growled and launched itself at the figure, which staggered backward into the mess hall under the impact. Oh, crap. I got to my hands and knees, lungs working in a futile effort to draw breath. The sounds of battle inside the mess hall didn't bode well. Concentrating, I willed my diaphragm to unspasm. It worked well enough that I was able to get to my feet and stumble into the mess hall after the wolf and the bogle. 
Sure enough, they were locked in combat. The bogle was on its back. Long-fingered hands with too many knuckles and sharp black nails clamped around the wolf's throat. The wolf snarled and snapped, its muzzle inches from the bogle's face. Cody, I wheezed. Down, boy. We need to question him. The wolf ignored me, continuing in its efforts to lunge forward and tear out the bogle's throat. On the floor of the mess hall, the bogle rolled its molten lava eyes at me. You brought a werewolf, he said? Dude, that's a little extreme. <laughs> I'm going to cut it off there. The Bogle is actually one of my favorite new Stop secondary it. characters in this series. Just like it's spelled, exactly. <clears throat> I'd probably do more justice in a week or so. Um, I will open this up to questions and answers in, in just a minute, but I'm curious to know if anybody here read my most recent official website update. And I did, but I don't remember it. I did it on the, the signing date. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I, 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 teased, I teased a little side project that will be unveiled soon, and I said it was shiny. I'm actually wearing an example. I was, I was, that was going to be my question. Where do I get one of those? Because I need one. Uh, I, I wasn't sure if the jeweler had gone live with the link, but I believe it can be found on rocklove.com, and I will be um, discussing and promoting this, but... A couple of months ago, I was approached by a professional jeweler, rocklove.com is her, her, her company, and she's worked with some authors that she likes and admires. She's done some work with television shows, and she said, I would love to do a piece of officially licensed Kushiel's Legacy jewelry. And she said, you know, for, for Tor to clear the rights, it would have to be something for a nonprofit project. Um, but she's like, you know, it's promotion and all the proceeds above the, the cost of producing the necklace will go toward a charity of your choosing. I said, great, our local library has a capital campaign going there in desperate need of a new facility. I think this is awesome. Um, so this is a prototype of, as you can see, it's a necklace based on Fedra's Briar Rose Mark. Um, Tor was willing to grant us the rights to do that since it is a nonprofit project and these will be for sale online. Will you post the link to Facebook? I will post the link many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, we were trying to get this, I think she was trying to get it live before Comic Con New York and then this unexpected trip to visit my friend came up, so I've been a little scattered with um, getting it together for an official rollout. Um, but yeah, I will promulgate it far and wide. And uh, the reverse has, actually has etched in it, uh, love as thou wilt. Shiny. Yeah, like I said, <laughs> as I say, shiny, both in the literal sense and in the... Uh, Firefly, Whedon verse <laughs> sense. I was when I read yeah, that, so. I thought it I thought it worked on both levels. <laughs> oh, she's writing Firefly now. <laughs> Just referencing. <laughs> so you guys are the first to know and the first to see. I believe this will be retailing for uh, eighty-five dollars. Um, over half of which will go to charity. So that's going to be cool. So I will now, at this point, officially open up to any questions, answers you guys might have. I know I've been here <laughs> doing this a number of years, so you might not have any left. <laughs> that tank may be empty. In which case, we'll just sign books and everybody goes home. <laughs>
Okay. All right. So I know you said you're not, you don't have any projects going right now, but will you ever be returning to the Kushio universe? Uh, at this point, I have no plans to do so. Okay. Uh, and as I say, every time I'm asked, I reserve the right to change my mind <laughs> if my muse decrees otherwise. Um, that world felt very thoroughly and deeply mined for story um, and incompleted. That doesn't mean I don't wake up a week from now and go, Bella Pock, it's a thing. Um, okay, I've toyed with that one a little. <clears throat> But at this point, no. Okay. That was going to be my question, was whether there was going to be a, a fourth, fourth trilogy about uh, 200 years more, more, more advanced in the future. I was thinking, uh, you, I was thinking prior, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, be a little bit more steampunk than, uh, yeah. than, the, than ancient. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do feel, uh, when I say it's been deeply mined for story, um, there are only so many narratives you can play out in a given setting before it feels like you're simply exploiting the setting. Mm -hmm. and, and in doing so, almost undermining what has gone before. Um, and that's one reason that I wouldn't return to that milieu unless I had an idea for you know, not just, ooh, some cool new characters and, and, and world building taking it 200 years in the future, but a story that was compelling that could be told in that milieu that still felt fresh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've read all your books, and, and I love The Age of the House series, but for me it's felt like a much younger series than anything else you've written, including the St. Olivia uh, books, which were younger than, for me, at least, than some of your other books, but still didn't feel like young adult fiction, whereas the Agent of Hell series feels like young adult fiction. Are you enjoying that genre? Are you going to stay there? Are you going to move back into... Uh, well, I don't think they're young adult fiction. They're definitely lighter. Lighter. Um, and I, I've always needed to do different things in between intensive uh, things, and it was really refreshing for me. Just to be able to use pop culture references was actually super fun, <laughs> and I enjoyed it a lot. I, I love the first person who dubbed this series Ghoulmore G Girls. <laughs> um, but I think you know, any time you incorporate comedy into something, the level of craftsmanship becomes deceptive because it's just as hard to, and in some ways harder, to incorporate that seamlessly uh, and, and have the, the whimsy and verisimilitude. Um, it, it, it's a subtler level of craftsmanship, and that's been a fun challenge for me as well. Uh, I think I was saying to Julie after she got to finally read the book all the way through, because <clears throat> my one beta reader gets them chapter by chapter, and it's very different to read it all the way through. That uh, There's a scene, I don't want to give any spoilers away in Poison Fruit, but um, when one character, in a very dramatic moment, shouts, I heard that! You can't make me do that! And it was just, it was so perfect, yet so inappropriate, yet so perfect. But, I don't know, it's, it's, um, it's a different kind of enjoyment, and I have really enjoyed it. But I'm ready to do, again, something different. Mm -hmm. um, probably because for the first time I was drawing on a really familiar setting. Um, trying to A, look at it objectively, and B, um, convey it, articulate it in a way that, that would be compelling to people who had no familiarity with it. You know, you lose a, a level of objectivity when you are literally writing what you know, something <laughs> I'd never done before. You'd had a question earlier. Uh, was this the final book in this trilogy that you yeah. basically answered? That? Yeah. 
Uh-huh. Any estimation on when your next book will be coming out? <laughs> 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 no, sorry. I, 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 that's something I'm, I'm still keeping under wraps for now. And I'm not, there are some things that are up in the air that I'm not sure about. So no idea at this point. I update it daily, but you know, Facebook has its mysterious algorithms that decides, yeah, you don't really want to see what you told it you want to see. So, but I, I try to, and if it's something important, I try to do it multiple times. Also, I also, uh, also I also will put things on my official website that, you know, so appearances, um, contact info for purchasing this. If you're ever like, hmm, I haven't seen anything on our Facebook feed for a long time, you know, check my official site and there'll be permanent links. Yeah, I just have to remember to do that. Stupid. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Or Twitter, I'm on Twitter too. I'm not really good at Twitter the way some people are good at Twitter, but I try. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am, this is not a terribly original answer, but I'm finally reading uh, The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt. Um, I don't read as much in science fiction and fantasy as I'd like to, and I don't love as much as I'd like to, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> um, probably the last thing I read in genre that I really enjoyed were uh, uh, N.K. Jemison's, um, I just read uh, the, the Killing Moon and the something, Sun. Uh, <laughs> and I had read her 100,000 Kingdoms before. Um, some really cool creative world building, the kind of stuff that as an author you look at and go, oh, <laughs> that's good, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> And that's, you know, I'm always wanting to feel that way, even if it turns you a little green. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. This might be an unfair question, but... Uh, so then I won't answer. <laughs> of the fictional worlds you've created, which one do you like best slash find the most interesting? Um... No, I don't think it's unfair. I do love the the milieu of the Kushil and Nama books very much. I think it's because I went into it in so much depth. There's so much richness and complexity, and you know, I drew on a very large portion of the globe and a great deal of history to to reinvent the world. So, I, you know, I don't feel I'm slighting my other creations and saying, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Were there any countries, roughly based on, in those books that you had not actually visited, that you were just basing kind of how you would recreate this world just based on research? Or yeah, or about 50, well no, it's <laughs> about 50 percent, about 50 percent. And in some cases, I was able to extrapolate from prior travel. Um, last summer, I had the opportunity to go to Croatia, which was fabulous. And that was one I had written about without having visited. And um, I, you know, I have to admit, there were some things that, details that I wish I'd known. Uh, in particular, you know, it's funny because we just were in the marketplace today and somebody was selling honey and there was raspberry honey and wildflower honey and blackberry honey. And, and I always have, I've tried various honeys, but you know, there's very little difference between them, <laughs> frankly. In Croatia, uh, the head of the publishing company who was driving us around, he pulled over at this one roadside stand, and there are dozens of them selling honey or cheese, and he's like, we're going to buy some honey. <laughs> <clears throat> and he bought two kinds, and one was just like a meadow honey that had, like, what is giving it this, this anise flavor? Where's this licorice flavor coming from? And he's asking the woman, and she's translating. It's some herb. And then there was another one that was uh, more from the forest, 
and it was a lot darker. And the scent of it, or the flavor of it, it, it had this evergreen quality that then we got to his uh, summer cottage on this island and there are evergreens around it. The scent of the resin hanging in the air was the flavor of the honey. It was just this wonderful, and I'm like, that detail I would have used. I was pretty damn pleased with the way the rest of the research played out. <laughs> how, many, how many years total in, in that world were you writing? Um, I was well, at least nine, because there are nine books, and I, I'd say 11 or 12 all told when you add in the research and gestation period. So, and, and that is again when people say, you know, are there going to be more? I'm like, that's a big period of your life to dedicate <laughs> to one thing. Anybody else? Questions? No? If not, I say let's wrap this up. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you again, Dwayne, for having me. And uh, hey, it's my birthday Eve. Let's celebrate and sign some books. <laughs>